Well, I think I'm recording again. So review from last time. We looked at the small signal analysis of the two-stage Miller compensated op amp, and we saw this gain expression. And we observed that in contrast to what we had earlier, we'll, we'll review that we had earlier when we did a um, internal node compensation to ground, we saw that there was, what, what appeared here that we didn't see before? A zero. And where is that zero located at? Right half plane zero. We have a right half plane zero that appeared in this. We have no reason to suspect there's a concern with that right half plane zero. Um, um, and then we looked at the game with feedback. And this is the game we had with feedback. And this is under the standard A over one plus A beta feedback configuration. Um, and we saw that the zero of the feedback amplifier was the same as the open loop amplifier, but certainly the poles were different. And they're different than what we had before we did Miller compensation. Um, in fact, um, this term here appeared in the denominator that was not there when we had a single capacitor from here to ground. Um, um, if we have a single capacitor from here to ground, um, this, this term and this term were the same, but this term here was S C sub C G zero zero, and this one here is approximately G M five C sub C. Um, so we we've, we've changed that that um, expression um, for the open loop gain and. The closed loop gain, do I have a comparison of the two? Well, here we calculate the Q um, for the feedback amplifier, which is related to compensation, which we haven't talked exactly what compensation is yet. We said we wanted to put Q between 0 0.707 and 0 0.505. Why do we want Q in that range? It's between 45 and 90, so it doesn't get too close to the imaginary axis. Right, between 45 and 90, so it doesn't get too close to imaginary axis. And, and what was magic about these two values, 0.707 and 0.5? Prevents, uh, when the feedback amplifier is going through, it's like when it goes above, like yeah, on the graph, when the pig. And when it gives above 0.707, then we have what? Ringing. Ringing. And we have peaking in the magnitude response of 0.505 or 0.5. So it's, it's kind of that transition between ringing in the transient response and peaking in the amplitude response. And both happen when you get above 0.707. And why don't we want to just go ahead and make it less than 0.5 and not worry about those things? Because the peaking is bad news. Right, that's why we, peaking is bad news, but if we say less than 0.5, it won't peak. And it won't ring. If we stay less than 0.5, it won't peak and it won't ring. So why don't we do that? It takes a while to reach. It takes a while to reach. It's a sluggish response, so you burn more power than you need to build your amplifier, right? So it would make your life easier in that you don't have to worry about ringing or or overshoot in the magnitude response, but it makes your life miserable because you don't have good good power um, efficiency. Um, we also observed that there were a lot of different ways that we can um, characterize a second order term um, in terms of the parameters of A0, A1, omega naught and Q, Z and omega naught, P1 and P2, or alpha and beta. Um, these are all two parameter characterizations of a second order factor, uh, of a second order term. Does it make a difference which of these we use? Not really, it's all the same, characterizing the same thing. Um, do we need more than one characterization? Not really. Why do we have so many different ways to characterize it? <laughs> what? Each discipline uses differently. Each what? Discipline. Each discipline you typically use things differently, and it kind of all comes together with the, the analog circuit designers. You've got to be able to talk to everybody. Okay. 
Um, we also observed how to quickly um, determine the uh, uh, poles uh, without using the quadratic equation. Um, and we observed that um, as long as the poles are widely separated, if they're not widely separated, you don't have a good amplifier. So if the poles are widely separated, we said that you could um, take these two terms and get the high frequency pole and get, take these two terms and get the low frequency pole without ever using a quadratic equation. So that determines P1 and that determines uh, P2. Um, and that's kind of important to save the calculation time. So we look at this uh, feedback amplifier that has the character phenomena looking like this. Without using a quadratic equation, determine the poles by inspection. So to get P1, we, to get high frequency pole, you take these terms here, factor out an S, and you see that P1 is a, the high frequency pole, I get to call it P2 is at minus 9,000. And to get the low frequency pole, we look at the other two terms um, and solve that equation, and see we see P low is equal to a minus two radians per second. Okay. And these are really accurate calculations. The ratio in this case is 4,500 to one. Do we expect this kind of a ratio in our poles of an, of an op amp? What kind of pole ratio are we expecting? Of what order of magnitude? What? Two orders. Not good enough. But uh, at least a couple decades. Do we uh -huh. have it? Does everybody remember? Depending on beta. It was, it was, it was uh, proportional to beta A naught. If A naught's 100,000 and beta's one, the pole ratio will be around 100,000. Okay? So we have pole ratios much, much bigger than this usually in our op amps. That's a big pole ratio. Do the poles want to be that far apart when we build stages? If you build two identical stages, about how will the poles be? We're on top of each other pretty much, right? So what we've got to do is we've got to build two stages that are not at all um, alike. They have to have dramatically different frequency response. Might want a lot of gain in both stages, but we don't want the bandwidth of the two of them to be the same, not even close. So let's talk about compensation. Um, what is compensation or frequency compensation? So I, I tried to go to several different places to just to get to see what the experts say. And I was a little bit surprised from Wikipedia. Now, I dug this out two years ago, so I haven't checked Wikipedia this morning again. Wikipedia is dynamic. Um, from Wikipedia, in electrical engineering, frequency compensation is a technique used in amplifiers and especially in amplifiers employing negative feedback, I'm not sure we're using others, but um, it usually has two primary goals. To uh, avoid the unintentional creation of positive feedback. Positive feedback must be bad. Which will cause the amplifier to oscillate and to control the overshoot and ringing in the amplifier's step response. It's kind of like a political statement. You can read it and say anything you want it to say. Um, so I went to Martin and John's, the textbook we used for this course. They choose not to give a definition, but they play rugby anyway. Um, no specific definition, but they make comparisons with optimal compensation. Well, they don't define that either. So we struck out in our book. Alan Holberg, another popular book that's typically used for 501. Um, the goal of compensation is to maintain stability when negative feedback is applied around the op amp. That stability term comes up in, in this definition here. I really think that if that's your goal, you're going to have lousy amplifiers. They do a good job of compensation in that book, but they don't define, in my mind, what they're really trying to do. Gray and Meyer, probably the most popular analog circuit um, textbook. It could be an alternative to the book we use in 501. And this is as close as they come. 
Thus, if this amplifier is to be used in a feedback loop with loop gain larger than A0 F1, efforts must be made to increase the phase margin. This process is known as compensation. So I think they define compensation to be increasing the phase margin. Again, it's a non-definition. From Sedger and Smith, um, the process of modifying the open loop gain is termed frequency compensation, and its purpose is to ensure that op-amp circuits will become stable as opposed to oscillatory. If you have a circuit that's about to become oscillatory, you've got a lousy amplifier. For Brazavi, typical op-amp circuits contain many poles. In a folded cascode topology, for example, both the folding node and the output node contribute poles. For this reason, op-amps must usually be compensated. That is, their open loop transfer characteristics must be modified such that the closed loop circuit is stable and the time domain response is well behaved. He says quite a few things there too. Um, it must be stable. Um, it seems like it's well behaved, you don't need to mention stable. Um, So what's the what's compensation, frequency compensation? What is the goal? I don't think anybody defines it correctly. And most people don't even try to define it. They just do it. Okay. I'm going to define compensation to be the manipulation of the poles and or zeros of the open loop amplifier so that when feedback is applied, the closed loop amplifier will perform acceptably. Perform like you want it to. I think that's what compensation is. Then you decide how the closed loop amplifier is supposed to perform, and then you do compensation to make that happen. This definition does not mention stability. It doesn't mention positive feedback. It doesn't mention negative feedback. It doesn't mention phase margin. It doesn't measure, mention oscillation. I think all those issues are irrelevant when we're doing compensation. Note that acceptable performance is strictly determined by the user in the contact of the application that you have. So I want to spend a little bit of time going through a few mathematical concepts that are related to compensation. Acceptable performance is often application dependent and somewhat interpretation dependent. Acceptable performance should include effects of process and temperature variations. If process and temperature vary, you want to still maintain acceptable um, performance. Although some think of compensation as a method of maintaining stability with feedback, Acceptable performance generally dictates much more stringent performance than stability. We pointed that out several times in this course. Compensation criteria are, are often an indirect indicator of some type of desired but unstated performance. People will give a compensation criteria, but don't indicate how that affects the performance of the system that they're working with. Varying approach and criteria are used for compensation, often resulting in similar but not identical performance. And finally, overcompensation often comes at a considerable expense. Increased power, increased area, decreased frequency response, and so forth. So we want to get it right. You want to do the right amount of compensation. <clears throat> compensation requirements are usually determined by the closed loop pole locations. We saw if we have a feed, amplifier with feedback, the denominator polynomial, the characters polynomial, is equal to D of S, which was D, D of S of the open loop amplifier, plus beta times N of S, where N of S was the numerator of the open loop amplifier. Often phase margin or gain margin criteria are used instead of pole Q criteria when compensating amplifiers. Um, and I think that's done for historical reasons. We're going to see 
that phase margin and gain margin are something you could have done in 1940 with a pencil and paper and a slide rule. Obtaining pole cues in 1940 was a real pain. Nyquist plots are an alternative stability criteria that is used in the design of amplifiers. We'll talk about Nyquist problems. Phase margin and gain margin criteria are directly related to Nyquist plots. Compensation requirements are strongly beta dependent. If the poles of the feedback amplifier um, are what determines the uh, performance of that feedback circuit, we certainly see beta appearing very prominently in this expression for the, for the characteristic polynomial. Um, the characteristic polynomial is obtained from the denominator term of the basic feedback equation. Um, some authors use the term A beta to be the loop gain. So if you, if you know what A is and what beta is, we, we define the product of A beta to be the, the loop gain. Theorem, the system is stable if and only if the closed loop poles lie in the open left half plane. So we see on the left uh, a situation where we have a stable amplifier. On the right, we have um, an unstable amplifier, even because there's a pair of complex conjugate poles in the right half plane, or a single real axis pole in the right half plane. Practically, we want to avoid having the closed loop amplifier poles close to measure axis um, to provide reasonable, uh, a reasonable stability margin um, to minimize ring in the time domain and to minimize peaking in the free domain. Um, uh, maybe I should even point that out because now I, I, I bring back in the issue of stability and I really don't want to. Whoops. Oh, I, I, I missed something on the slide. Ah. A 45 degree pole pair angle corresponds to what Q? 0.707. 0.707. And a 90 degree pole angle um, on a complex conjugate pole pair corresponds to Q of a half. Okay, we just want to remember that. Talk about Nyquist plots. The Nyquist plot is a plot of the loop gain versus j omega in the complex plane, or omega going between plus and minus infinity. Um, so we have a theorem that says the system is stable if and only if the Nyquist plot does not encircle the point minus one plus j zero. Has everybody seen that before? Circuit is stable if and only if. Um, if there are multiple crossings of the real axis by the Nyquist plot, the term encirclement requires a formal definition. I'm not going to go into the details there. In a lot of the controls courses, you go into details about multiple crossings of the, um, the real axis. Um, very few amplifiers that we will design have multiple crossings, so we won't worry about um, um, what happens if you have multiple crossings. So here's a Nyquist plot. And it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Um, here we start at omega equals minus infinity, and we're plotting a loop gain a beta, um, omega equals zero someplace here, and come back towards omega equals plus infinity. And in this case, the amplifier is stable because this Nyquist plot does not include the point minus one plus j zero. Is, is that a theorem? We have stability. We said the system is stable if and only if there's no poles um, in the, uh, if all poles are in the left half plane. Is, is this another definition of stability or is this a theorem? By the way, this criteria was useful in 1940 because with the slide rule and a pencil and paper, 
we could easily calculate A beta at different frequencies, calculate the magnitude and calculate the phase, and make this plot. Didn't have computers, didn't even have handheld calculators. We had slide rules and pencil and paper. So this is the legacy of what the engineers and mathematicians gave us in the pre-computer era. So here's an example. If A of S is 100 over S plus 1 and beta is equal to half, um, then A beta is 50 over J omega plus 1, and we can plot um, this A beta as a function of omega, and we see when omega goes to plus or minus infinity, this goes to zero, and it, it differs from zero um, when um, omega is not plus or minus infinity, and it traces out this locus here. Um, so, in this case, the Nyquist plot has a radius of, of 25, and of course, the feedback amplifier with this value of beta will be stable because it does not encircle a point minus one plus j zero. Um, um, the, does everybody know where this Nyquist plot comes from and why it, it is essentially the same stability criteria we had, but all the poles must lie in the over left half plane? We talked about that before. The so Nyquist plot is simply a mapping from the complex plane to the complex plane. So here's a complex plane that shows the poles. Could show the zeros too, but zeros don't affect stability. I'm going to make a mapping um, with A beta. And so if, if A and beta are complex quantities, I can take any complex quantity here, plug it into the loop gain expression, and it gives me a new complex quantity, again in the complex plane. If I look at the imaginary axis, the imaginary axis would correspond to A beta at J omega. Omega going to between minus infinity and plus infinity. So the image of the imaginary axis under this loop gain mapping is an Nyquist plot. So what we've done then is we've taken the S plane that shows the poles and we've contorted it and mapped it back into another complex plane. We folded up that imaginary axis. As it turns out, this mapping has some nice properties. The imaginary axis broke the original S plane into two parts, the left half plane and the right half plane. The mapping breaks the complex plane into two parts, the inside part and the outside part. The inside part um, corresponds to the right half plane. The outside part corresponds to the left half plane, and the Nyquist plot corresponds to the imaginary axis. Furthermore, if you're at a pole, there will be a pole only when A beta is equal to minus 1. So every pole will map to minus 1 plus J0. So the image of all these poles is this point right here. So we, we contort it and we fold it on top of itself a bunch of times. Make sense? So, amplifier stable if and only if all the poles lie in the left half plane. Since this is, since the outside of this is the image of the left half plane, it'll be stable if and only if this point is outside the Nyquist plot. Make sense? So it's really the same criteria we had before. We just folded up that that complex that that imaginary axis and call that the Nyquist plot. You talked about that before, right? Okay, good. Um, well, again, it was important in the '30s to the '60s. Now, conceptually, we would like to see to it that the Nyquist plot doesn't get too close to that point. 
Getting close to that point might be analogous to having the angle of the poles be, be less than 45 degrees. So conceptually, we'd like to think of a region around this minus one plus J zero, and we we'll want to be sure that Nyquist plot doesn't get inside that, that region. But it's not natural to determine what that region is. We just don't want to get too close. We want it to get close in a square sense, a circle sense, an ellipse sense, or some other sense. So here's a couple of different neighborhoods we can put around that point that we want to avoid. We're going to define the phase margin to be the angle of A beta when the magnitude of A beta is equal to 1. So I can put in the unit circle. The unit circle corresponds to A beta equal 1. Magnitude A beta equals 1. Um, and where that unit circle intersects the Nyquist plot, the magnitude of A beta is equal to 1. So now we can look at the angle of A beta. And we want to be sure that, well, if, if it was if it was going to go through that point, the angle would be a, would, would be um, zero degrees, um, or the angle would be 180 degrees. Excuse me. If, if you measure relative to the positive real axis, if it were to go through that point, the Nyquist plot would go through that point, then the angle would be 180 degrees. So we define the phase margin to be 180 degrees minus the angle of A beta with the magnitude of A beta equal one. That is. It's this, this angle from here to here. And we define the gain margin to be the distance between this point and the Nyquist plot when the angle of A beta is 180 degrees. So Nyquist and gain phase plots um, convey identical information. So here's a Nyquist plot. It's a plot of A beta as a function of omega, and it's got, this is a frequency axis, and the frequency axis is all screwed up and it's nonlinear. I could also have two separate plots with either a linear or logarithmic omega axis, and I could talk, plot the magnitude and the phase um, and I'd have exactly the same information as I have for the Nyquist plot. So the Nyquist plot and these gain phase plots, which are oftentimes called, what's another name for these gain phase plots? Bode. Bode plots. So the Bode plots and the Nyquist plots really are, are exactly the same thing, just displayed differently. Either in a two-dimensional representation or a three, a two two-dimensional representations. The A beta plots, of course, change with different values of beta. If you have different values of beta, A beta should change. Often beta is independent of frequency. Um, in this case, the A beta plot is just a shifted version of the A plot. If we have a logarithmic axis, if you multiply by a constant that's not frequency dependent, you just shift the, the constant up or down. And in this case, the phase of A beta, remember the phase of A beta had to do with phase margin. The phase of A beta is the same as the phase of A if beta is constant. Instead of plotting A beta, we oftentimes plot the magnitude of A. Um, and the phase of A. And then superimpose the magnitude of beta on top of it. Um, to get gain and phase margins. Um, and the reason we do that is if we want to make a mapping from the Nyquist plot to a Bode plot, 
Every different value of beta requires a different Bode plot. If you plot the magnitude and the phase of the gain, and, and beta is frequency dependent, then different values of A beta would just correspond to different horizontal intersections of the, uh, of the Bode plots. So let's look at gain and phase margin. Um, remember, the gain and phase margin came from the Nyquist plots. But since the Nyquist plots and the Bode plots contain the same information, we can also get gain and phase margin information um, from the, um, the Bode plots. So if we have T of S is equal to 1,000 over S plus 1, that's a single pole amplifier with a gain of 1,000. Um, the um, gain plot, um, 1,060 dBs, it comes out to one radian per second and starts to fall off 20 dB per decade. So this is the gain plot and the phase plot. Um, phase starts out at zero and it eventually gets to accumulate at 90 degrees of phase, minus 90 degrees of phase and omega equals infinity. So the phase comes out and around omega equals one per radian per second is at 45 degrees and then it continues on down to minus 90 degrees. Um, if you look at the uh, phase margin, it was defined to be 180 degrees minus the angle of A beta. And if beta is frequency independent, then the angle of A beta is equal to the angle of A. It's 180 degrees minus the angle of A then. When um, uh, magnitude of A, beta equals one. And so I'm here assuming beta is equal to one. So here's where the magnitude of A beta equals one, this frequency, I go, come down here and the distance between 180 degrees and the angle is the phase margin. We see that for any value of beta, the phase margin is, is at least 90 degrees. If beta was smaller, this curve would be higher, and we move over here, the phase margin would be even bigger than 90 degrees. So we see that for um, um, a single pole amplifier, uh, we have more than, than 90 degrees phase margin. We don't have to compensate single, single order amplifiers usually. Usually we don't have to worry about ringing, we don't have to use it, worry about overshoot. One th problem I see um, a lot of um, times cropping up um, is a, a, a phase plot that looks like this. The angle starts to go down, and then all of a sudden we see a jump that would come back down like this. Has everybody seen that before? And, 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 and what's causing this? Is the phase real, is the phase real sensitive to frequency in this region here so we get this jump? No, nope. what's the reason? Is just the way you're plotting it? Because technically it could still go down. That's right. So all amplifiers are gonna have continuous magnitude and phase characteristics. Anytime you have discontinuity, it's an artifact of the arc tangent function. So the arc tangent function is multiple valued. When it jumps back up into here, you just need to bring this on down and look at a continuous curve. I don't know how often I've seen people um, make, make comments about something going on in the phase when they see the discontinuity. It's just strictly an artifact of the way you look at it. Um, here's a, another example. Um, here I'm assuming that um, beta is equal to 0.05, 1 over 20. So I plot the magnitude of A and, and the 1 over beta curves, they intersect here. And I assume this was the angle, phase margin is distributed here and here. Um, here, um, I'm plotting um, the same gain characteristic, same phase characteristic, but now beta is equal to 1 instead of 0 0.05. And we see the phase margin here is, is 0. If the phase margin is 0, that would correspond to a pole 
um, on the measuring axis. Um, here's a second order system with a, a 200 to 1 pole spread um, and a gain of 1,000. This is not a high gain amplifier. And we see that for beta equal to um, 1 over 30, the phase margin is about, um, what, 40 degrees or something. Is that clear? But if I take that same amplifier and I go to the beta equal to one situation, um, I see that this curve moves down, my frequency moves to the right, and the um, angle is more than 180 degrees, so we see it becomes unstable. So the smaller the value of beta, the easier it is to maintain, maintain stability. Now I'm a little bit uneasy about talking about stability but that's one thing that we, we typically try to draw conclusions from, from magnitude and, and phase margins. Here's a third order amplifier. Um, and here I put a beta of 0.05. Even with a beta of 0.05, um, this amplifier will be unstable uh, because the um, phase margin is negative. Gain margin. Um, everybody been through gain and phase margin in other courses. Okay, so let's just step ahead then. So now we've now we've defined gain and phase margin. Gain and phase margin are things that we could talk about in 19, 1930. We could calculate in nineteen thirty. But I've never attempted to relate gain and phase margin to anything other than stability. In general, the relationship between phase margin and the pole Q is independent, is dependent upon the order of the transfer function and the location of the zeros. The Nyquist plot is affected by the zeros as well. The zeros affect the gain and phase margin. The zeros don't affect the pole locations. That's kind of scary because you've got performance of your circuits that are dominantly determined by the pole locations, but yet your gain and phase margins are also affected by the zeros. Okay. Um, in the special case, that the open loop amplifier is second order low pass. So if you have a second order low pass amplifier, a closed form analytics, analytical relationship exists between the pole Q and the phase margin. And this is independent of A naught and beta. So the pole Q is equal to, we can show this. It's the kind of thing that I like to do as a homework assignment rather than do it analytically. Uh, has anybody seen this expression before? Tim, where have you seen it? I've seen controls. I'm pretty sure we went over it. Okay. A bit. So keep in mind the hypothesis, because this only applies if these hypotheses are satisfied. Second order low pass system. The whole Q is directly related to the phase margin. Um, or the phase margin is equal to arc cosine of, of this function of Q. The region of interest is invariably Q between 0.5 and 0.7. We know why that's the case, right? So if Q is between 0.5 and 0.7, we can find what the corresponding phase margin is. Large Q introduces unacceptable ringing and settling, we know that. A smaller Q slows the amplifier response down. That's why you want Q typically between 0.5 and 0.707. So here's a, a plot of the pole Q versus phase margin for a second order low pass amplifier. And we see that from 0.5, well, well, so here's what the relationship is. 
And if Q is between 0.5 and 0.707, we're looking at regions between here and about here. Does that make sense? So I, I, I zoomed in on that region, and now I'm going to put the 0.5 and 0.707 in. And as long as it queues between 0.5 and 0.707, the phase margin is going to be between about 65 degrees and about um, 78 degrees. Make sense? Okay, so if you have a second order low pass amplifier, it makes no difference whether you work with phase margin criteria or pole Q criteria, because there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the two. Here's a plot of the magnitude response of a second order low pass function as a function of Q. And we see that uh, peaking occurs when Q gets large, Q, Z is one over two Q. And we see that when um, Q gets small, it's a sluggish magnitude response. Now keep in mind, this only applies for second order low path functions. Um, and uh, this is the step response um, for, um, I, I said that wrong. This is a step response, and this is the magnitude um, response. Um, and we can see that the ring occurs when we have high values of, of Q. Um, this is the overshoot in the magnitude response. Do I have this right? Step response, magnitude response. Yeah, make, so we see the overshoot occurring in the magnitude response, and this is a plot of the. What did I get? Step response to ringing. Um, well, this is the overshoot in the magnitude response now, as a function of of Q. So. Gain and phase margin performance is often strongly dependent upon the architecture. Um, different architectures have different zeros and different orders. The relationship between overshoot and ringing and phase margin were developed only for the second order low pass gain characteristics and differ dramatically for our higher order structures. Absolute gain and phase margin criteria are not robust to changes in architecture or order. It is often difficult to correctly break the loop to determine the loop gain um, with the correct loading loop. We'll talk about, about that later. So we're out of time. So the point I want to emphasize here then is when you use pole two criteria, you know exactly what that does to your magnitude response and your step response. If you do phase and gain margin criteria, there is no relationship between the, the pole Q or the ring or the overshoot um, and the phase margin or the gain margin. You're kind of on your own there. But mo a lot of authors, many authors, will, will say they want a certain phase margin criteria for an amplifier of a given order with certain zeros, and you kind of take your licks in regard to what your magnitude response is going to look like or what your step response is going to look like. Does that make sense? Any, any questions? That's all for today, thanks.